I came upon a church one day when I was new in town. I went inside to sing and pray and sat myself right down. It had a steeple white and tall and oak doors open wide. So I did not suspect at all that evil lurked inside the church of the hermit crab. Those were the opening words of a poem I wrote back in 1995. The Church of the Hermit Crab was not real, of course, just the product of poetic license. But unfortunately, there are many real churches just like that. Let's see why. Welcome to Bible Nook's worship service. Pastor David Reed has authored numerous books, served as a contributing editor of Dr. Walter Martin's Christian Research Journal, taught at Spurgeon's in London, and pastored Emmanuel Baptist Church in New Bedford, Massachusetts. He now provides these worship services for individuals at home and free to use by small groups and churches. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on our service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for making the arrangement for your people to meet on a regular basis whether in person or remotely or by whatever means possible, to fellowship together, to hear your word, to lift our voices together in songs of praise to you. So we pray now that you'll bless all those who join us in the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in singing God's praise as we sing, And Can It Be?
Nearly 2,000 years ago, the disciples gathered around Jesus and asked him to teach them how to pray. And he gave them the words of the Lord's Prayer, the Our Father Prayer, that Christians have been repeating down through the centuries. Let's join our own voices now in that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. At the end of today's service, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper, so be sure to have some bread and juice on hand so that we can celebrate communion together after the message. Bible Nook provides printed books and Bibles that you can order online at Amazon and elsewhere. But there's no need to buy anything because you can read most of these books and Bibles for free online or download them for free in digital form at BibleNook.com. Our videos of worship services and individual messages remain available for streaming at YouTube.com slash BibleNook and at Facebook.com slash BibleNook Ministry. <coughs> These services are aimed at providing traditional worship services for believers who otherwise would not have them because they're confined to the home or because they don't have a nearby church that sings traditional hymns and preaches Bible messages. And they're also aimed at reaching the world with messages proclaiming and upholding the gospel of Christ. We pay Facebook to boost our messages and we pay Google to advertise our YouTube messages with the result that the thought-provoking thumbnails, a few of which you see here, reach millions of people. And Facebook and YouTube report more than a half a million views of the videos by people who watched and listened between January and the first week of August, 2023. To accomplish all of that, we spent $3,300 during that same time period, spending all the money we received on spreading the gospel message. No one takes any salary from Bible Nook. All the gifts we receive go directly to the expense of spreading Bible messages. If the Lord moves your heart to spend some of your resources on this gospel outreach, you can do so by visiting BibleNook.com and clicking the Donate button on the home page, or by sending a check to Bible Nook 214 Onset Avenue Sweet 1464, Onset, Massachusetts, 02558. <laughs> Today's scripture reading is from the New Testament letter of Jude, beginning with the third verse. Beloved, although I made every effort to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt it necessary to write and urge you to contend earnestly for the faith entrusted once for all to the saints. For certain men have crept in among you unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. They turned the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. May the Lord add his blessing to our reading of his word. Let's sing praises to him now as we join together in the words of On a Hill Far Away, the Old Rugged Cross.
Church of the Hermit Crab. I came upon a church one day when I was new in town. I went inside to sing and pray and sat myself right down. It had a steeple white and tall and oak doors open wide. So I did not suspect at all that evil lurked inside the Church of the Hermit Crab. The sign proclaimed that Jesus saves. The pastor prayed quite well. God's goodness, peace, and love were named, and someone rang the bell. It took a while for me to see that neath sweet smile and song, a trap was laid for you and me. The bell was just death's gong. A congregation once lived there of Christians true and bold, they packed the place with space nowhere, and so the church was sold. A new home they went off to find, the spirit he did guide. An empty shell was left behind, and evil crawled inside the church of the hermit crab. Good camouflage, a place to stay, it claimed the empty shell, a hiding place to wait for prey and snatch them down to hell. That woman Jezebel was there, of whom the Bible warns, a twisted gospel I could hear amid the choking thorns. Get out, get out, the Lord did say, he spoke within my heart. This is no place for you to stay. Right now you must depart. From safely down the street I turned and looked once more to see the place that I had just now learned that all good folk must flee the church 
of the Hermit Crab. The Church of the Hermit Crab was a poem that I wrote back in 1995. And that church, of course, was not real. It was just the product of, prophet of poetic license. But unfortunately, there are many real churches just like that. Let's see why. But first, let's make sure everyone understands what a hermit crab is. Otherwise, the illustration loses its impact. So we'll look at a couple of photos and videos, since a picture is worth a thousand words. All sorts of crabs are crustacean shellfish that usually have a hard shell covering their body and multiple pairs of legs. Some of those legs are for walking and some have claws for grabbing food and for protection. A hermit crab is a particular type of crab that does not have a shell of its own. Rather, it has a soft, vulnerable body that it has to shield by living inside an abandoned snail shell. Snail shells, like this one that you can see here, come in a variety of shapes and sizes. And that's because as the snail grows, it manufactures more and more shell material and grows the shell with it. The shells left by dead snails provide the protection that a hermit crab needs. Without such an adopted shell, a hermit crab would be easy prey for predators. So the hermit crab moves into an abandoned snail shell and wears it like a protective suit of armor. Its claws stick out, but they're protected with their own shell-like covering. But the hermit crab's soft body remains safely within the snail shell. You can see here in this video that this hermit crab is walking around carrying that snail shell with it. It keeps the shell on it always because even a moment or two outside the shell and it could easily be eaten by something else. This hermit crab has been living in a snail shell that is not a good fit. He probably outgrew a smaller shell and moved into this one in a pinch because it was all that was available at the time, but it's too large for him. So we see him here examining a new shell that he found. He's already spent a long time examining the new shell, tediously checking it out before moving it in, moving into it rather, but I've trimmed away that earlier part of the video. Here he is moving his soft body into that shell to make it his own, and he'll live now in that snail shell and have the protection that he needs. So that's what a hermit crab is, and that's the illustration that I used in my poem. A vibrant, growing Christian congregation moves away to a larger church building and puts their old building up for sale. That old, empty church building becomes like an abandoned snail shell. The new occupants who purchase and move into the building turn out to be quite different from the original occupants, as different as a hermit crab is from a snail. Imitation Christians are not really Christians at all, and that's who moved in. The church building still looks the same as it did before, with its tall white steeple and church bell, but it's no longer really a Christian church. As in the poem, a visitor could be deceived, thinking at first that he had stepped into a real church. But God soon reveals to him that he is among false brothers and needs to leave. So that poem, The Church of the Hermit Crab, is meant as a warning to beware of deceptive appearances when it comes to visiting or joining a church. The Apostle Paul wrote that he himself had found himself in dangers among false brothers. He said, I have been on frequent journeys in dangers from rivers, dangers from robbers, dangers from my countrymen, dangers from the Gentiles, dangers in the city, dangers in the wilderness, dangers at sea, dangers among false brothers. The empty building in the Church of the Hermit Crab poem lay empty and then came to be occupied by a congregation of false brothers because the original occupants had sold the building. But it can often happen that a congregation 
simply changes its character over the years as people come and go and as the leadership changes. The church doesn't have to empty out for this to happen with a whole new group of people replacing them. Rather, it can happen gradually without being noticed. The New Testament writer Jude describes the process of a hermit crab call, crawling into a church, so to speak, when he says this in his letter. Beloved, although I made every effort to write to you about the salvation we share, I felt it necessary to write and urge you to contend earnestly for the faith entrusted once for all to the saints. For certain men have crept in among you, unnoticed, ungodly ones who were designated long ago for condemnation. They turn the grace of our God into a license for immorality, and they deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. Jude warned Christians to contend or fight for the faith, because immoral, ungodly men had crept in among them. These evil men did not march in boisterously as a group. No, they crept in one at a time, unnoticed, as Jude says. But their numbers and influence had grown to the point that Jude urged his readers to contend for the faith, to fight for the faith, before such men took over the churches completely. Even back in the first century, while the apostles were still alive and ministering, some churches were being taken over by such men. Those churches were being turned into the church of the hermit crab by evil men who crept in unnoticed and took over. For example, the Apostle John wrote in his third letter, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. So even back then in the first century, there were evil men like Diotrephes who rose to positions of power in the churches and who turned their Christian church into a church of the hermit crab, a church where evil crawled inside and took control. Now, it's not popular in today's evangelical churches to talk about such negative things. It's almost as if we have today an 11th commandment, thou shalt not be negative. But if you're a Bible reader, you know that a large part of the New Testament is devoted to combating evil influences in the churches. In fact, that's true of the entire Bible both Old and New Testaments. In the Old Testament, Moses and then the prophets were always pushing back against evil men who kept dragging the Israelites into idolatry or sexual immorality. Israel was God's church or congregation back then, and the prophets waged a constant battle to keep wicked kings and even Queen Jezebel from turning the nation into a church of the hermit crab. You can't read very far in the Old Testament without running into those battles inside God's Jewish congregation. And so it shouldn't surprise us that Satan the devil, who was behind that idolatry and immorality in the Old Testament, also kept trying to introduce the same things into the early Christian churches. So the New Testament writers had to keep pushing back to keep those evil influences out of the early churches. The only way to keep that popular 11th commandment, thou shalt not be negative, is to avoid reading a large part of the New Testament. Right away we see in the book of Acts that the apostles had to fight against Judaizers in the church who taught salvation through Jewish law instead of through Christ alone. And then as we go on to read Paul's letters, we find him addressing similar disturbances in the churches he wrote to. The situation in the church in Corinth was so bad that Paul told them, your meetings for worship 
actually do more harm than good. Yes, Paul told the Corinthians, your meetings for worship actually do more harm than good. The Corinthians church was in danger of becoming a church of the hermit crab. And then in his letter to the Galatian church, Paul pointed out that evil men had crept into that church, teaching a different gospel to the point that the Galatians were deserting Christ. Paul told them, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So Paul wrote to the Galatians to stop that from happening, to expose those evil people who were throwing that church into confusion by perverting the gospel of Christ. The different gospel that those men were preaching was really no gospel at all, Paul said. And if the Galatian church kept listening to preachers like that, they would no longer be a Christian church. They would become a church of the hermit crab, no longer following Christ, but preaching a false gospel instead. Paul wrote his letter to the Galatians, to stop that from happening. The Apostle Peter's letters were addressed more broadly, not to a particular church like Paul's letter to the Galatian church or his letter to the Corinthian church, but more broadly to the churches everywhere. And Peter, too, warned of false teachers who would engage in depraved sexual immorality while teaching heresies and denying Christ. Peter wrote, there were also false prophets among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you. They will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the sovereign Lord who bought them, bringing swift destruction on themselves. Many will follow their depraved conduct and will bring the way of truth into disrepute. In their greed, these teachers will exploit you with fabricated stories. Peter went on at great length, warning against such false teachers who would come in among you, teaching their fabricated stories instead of preaching the real gospel. And then the Apostle John, in his letters that appear toward the end of the Bible, similarly warns against false teachers infiltrating the churches. In his first letter, John says, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. John continues on to warn that people would come into the churches who had not God's Holy Spirit, but rather the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard is coming and which is already in the world at this time. Then in his second letter, John elaborates on this warning and says that many false teachers would depart from Christ's true teachings. Since Christian churches met in private homes back then, he stresses that believers should not welcome such evil teachers into their house churches. He says, Whoever transgresses and doesn't remain in the teaching of Christ doesn't have God. He who remains in the teaching the same has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and doesn't bring this teaching, don't receive him into your house and don't welcome him, for he who welcomes him participates in his evil deeds. So welcoming such a false teacher into one of the first century house churches would be like welcoming a hermit crab to crawl into the shell Welcoming such a hermit crab-like false teacher would amount to sharing in that false teacher's anti-Christian activities. Sometimes, though, it would not be a visiting teacher from outside who would bring false teachings into a church. Sometimes it would be someone from inside the church itself who would turn away to false teaching. It could be someone in leadership who would begin to misuse their authority within the church. That seems to be what happened when the Apostle John said, 
as we noted earlier, I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to be first, will not welcome us. So when I come, I will call attention to what he is doing, spreading malicious nonsense about us. Not satisfied with that, he even refuses to welcome other believers. He also stops those who want to do so and puts them out of the church. Diotrephes, who John warns against, was part of the leadership of that church, but he no longer held to the teaching of the apostles or looked to them for instruction. Instead, he elevated himself to first place among the leadership, and he expelled from the membership any who would welcome the apostles or their representatives. So working evil from within, Diotrephes was changing that church into a church of the hermit crab. Still, John indicated that he would visit that church and he would deal with Diotrephes. And as one of the twelve apostles, John had apostolic power and authority to put Diotrephes in his place. But history indicates that John was then an old man, the last one of the apostles still alive at that time. Once John finished his course on earth, it would become easier for men like Diotrephes to take over churches. The Apostle Paul was also aware of the evil that would grow in many churches after the apostles were no longer around to stop it. Paul told the elders of the churches in Ephesus, For I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Paul warned that false teachers would come from outside and also from within the existing church leadership. So how does all of this affect us today? It helps us understand church history, why some churches went off course very early. It helps us understand why we see famous old cathedrals full of statues that people bow down to and pray to like idols, where people stand in awe of leaders who boast and wear fancy costumes as bishops, cardinals, and popes. It helps us understand how false teachers in the 1800s were able to set up false church organizations like the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, drawing tens of millions of followers. It helps us understand how churches that preached the Bible for centuries could now fall into the hands of evil men and women who raise the rainbow flag of sexual perversion and who put lesbians and homosexuals into their pulpits. It helps us understand how now, even as we speak, churches are changing their programs to tickle people's ears to make people feel good about themselves, to entertain them on Sunday mornings with rock music and light shows. Those churches of the hermit crab are having a grand time today, parading around and calling themselves Christian. But they will all be called to account by the real Christ. It will not go well for them. Jesus said, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me you who break God's laws. Yes, they may claim to look to Jesus as their Lord and Savior, but Christ himself knows the real believers from the hermit crabs that run many churches. And if we prayerfully read the Bible, we too will recognize the church of the hermit crab and will get out before it's too late. Let's pray. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for helping us through your word, the Bible, to understand why so many churches are in the condition that they're in, claiming to represent you, but really being far away from you, as far away from you as a hermit crab is from a snail. We thank you, Lord, for showing us these things in powerful ways through the Holy Scriptures, and we pray you help us to apply it in our own lives so that we won't be misled or deceived or end up following a church of the hermit crab. We thank you, Lord, for sending us the liberating truth of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's join now in singing, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. God told the prophet Jeremiah of a time when the old covenant that God established through Moses would be replaced by a new covenant. And our Lord Jesus instituted that new covenant the night before he went to the cross. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's all partake of the body of Christ.
Father, we thank you for sending your son to die in our place, that body of his broken on the cross for us. We thank you that we can express our faith in your, what you did by our prayer and by our participating in this communion. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, we thank you for the blood of your son poured out on the cross for us to buy our forgiveness and to buy everlasting life for us so that we can have hope to live with you forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all partake of the blood of Christ. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Let's join together in singing the first verse of Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love, the fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to turn our hearts and minds away from the troubles of this world for a brief period of time to consider your word, to pray to you, and to lift our voices together in songs of praise. We thank you for blessing us with these things to refresh us, and we pray that you'll help us keep our eyes on you through the week with your gospel on our lips to share with others. In Jesus' name, amen. God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. By his counsel, God uphold you with his sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet, till we meet, till we meet at Jesus' feet. Till we meet, till we meet. God be with you till we meet again. Our seven o'clock Eastern Time Wednesday evening remote Bible study and prayer meeting is studying the book of Acts now, using the Bible itself as our textbook. It's very informal, and you are very welcome to join us. Any time after 6.45 Eastern Time on Wednesday, just dial this number, 951-799-9542, and you'll be connected. Or click the permanent Zoom link that's posted on Facebook. God bless. Keep safe.